Hi, everyone. I'm Natalie Gochner, and this is Both Sides of the Aisle. Welcome back. Yeah. I'm so excited to be with my friends in studio to talk about current issues. Shireen Gorbani on the left. Uh, Hello. So good to be with you, and hi to the listeners. And John Dougal on the right. Hey, always great to be back. Uh, Listen, um, this isn't like what you'd think we'd start out the program with, but the U.N. Secretary General has asked for a polio. This is a polio pause right now. A polio pause to conduct What is a polio pause? Well, it's where you... You have a ceasefire so you can go in and do a vaccination campaign for children in, in Gaza. When you said polio pause, I'm thinking we're going to stop giving polio shots to kids. Yeah, and yeah. What, what a, if, okay. I think, so right? Stop the war. You see this as stop a the as war stop to, the war to go take care of some humanitarian needs. A 10-month-old baby, first case of polio in a quarter of a century. The devastation that has happened in Gaza suggests that this could become polio, could become a crisis rapidly, right? So the hospital infrastructure is basically gone. Many people, lots of people are moving, living in tents, do not have access to sanitation. Um, the, The circumstances are ripe for this to become an absolute crisis on top of the humanitarian crisis mm-hmm. that is already playing out. So um, this is a I mean, I think it's a good idea, but so would a, so would a ceasefire and an end to this war. Yeah. John, are you watching the gray hairs accumulate on the Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken's hair? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's it's aging gray, through all this. Grayer and grayer and grayer. It's like what happens with presidents as well. But yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. And, 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 and you listen and every time I he's like in a different country. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I get the sense that he is literally living on an airplane as he flies from country to country, 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 country. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So back uh, in the lower 48 or back in the home front, uh, we've got the Democratic National Convention going on. We do. This, Thanks for the warning. Yeah. This is something. What are you, what are you seeing, Natalie? Well, I mean. <laughs> Not hope and change. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I don't watch conventions. I got better things to be doing in the evenings. Ooh. Ooh. You know, but, but. Interestingly, I, I the Republican convention fascinated me. It was so well scripted and it was inclusive. And I, I did listen to Nikki Haley. I'm a Nikki Haley fan. And so I listened to her speech and I've been paying more attention than usual. Shereen, that's the way I'll answer that. And uh, you can pepper me and John with some other questions. But I thought that uh, Kamala Harris's husband, yeah. his speech, Doug, Dougie, Dougie, <laughs> Emhoff, <laughs> I yeah. thought he was brilliant in the way he was so approachable and um and you like the story about you know he, he gets her number blind date lined up and calls at what was it, 8 eight thirty in the morning yeah who does that who does that and someone who's left, excited left a rambling voicemail that i guess kamala kept and now plays on their anniversary and what is yeah, it and he 10 said, year anniversary or something coming up on thursday yeah, and he said i love her smile i love her laugh you know these yeah. things that personalized her for things that she's being ridiculed for by her opposition uh I did not watch Hillary Clinton's speech, but I had several women who are not Hillary Clinton fans in the professional work world tell me they were so impressed. Yeah. And it really interested me. So these are Republican women that are professionals that somehow caught that speech and just said it was powerful. Yeah. So did tell they, us more. Did they say why? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I would say from my perspective, it, it feels like both an opportunity for thinking through the sort of monumental moment that we're in, but also remembering that we've been here before and that if we're going to go on popular vote, this country was ready to elect a female president. This country has elected a black president, right? We have, there is more, I think, flexibility and and opportunity for growth inside of what we think is possible. And certainly you have to have that person there standing there. But it was really incredible. And I also think that it was a, a, a reminder of just how deeply, though you may have disagreed with her politics, mm-hmm. I think how deeply competent, how incredibly intelligent. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she is funny. It's like, I, I feel like she's mischaracterized a lot yeah, as being yeah. really stiff. But she really laid out a vision for, you know, um, the opportunity, the, the moment that we're in that I thought to was not go backwards, to not go back. Yeah. John, Michelle Obama. Now, I did listen to her speech. I don't know if you caught any I, part I of that. I caught part of his, but I didn't get hers. She rocked the house. That's what I heard. She rocked the house. And there was one key moment where she said something like, you know, to our former president, this is a black job. Yeah. Maybe this is one of the black jobs he keeps talking about. 
Yeah. She and 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 of course, President Obama, as he came out, he, he basically said, how would you like to follow her? <laughs> and he was spot on. Yeah. She was terrific. And I I didn't realize I, I knew her mother had passed and I'd forgotten how um, pivotal she was in that relationship and 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 even in the White House. Yeah. And, then, and then I remember the articles I read after she'd passed. And, yeah. But it just sounds like Michelle came from such a incredible high character woman. Yeah. And that it affected the president. And these two, I mean, they're an American success story. Yeah. No. Whether you just, whether you agree with their policies or not. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and their character. And their character is a success story, right? I yes. Mean, and, and so I, I don't know. I thought it was, I, I think there's something special happening here. Yeah. I don't think anyone could have predicted this. Uh, the, the way that this convention has you don't, they're not talking about Biden anymore. No. And you know what else we're not talking about is Donald Trump. Yeah. Honestly. Honestly. This is a vision for a future of America that includes pathways for people to find economic success, for businesses, large and small, to be able to grow, for us to be able to protect the environment, increase access to democracy, something that we could maybe use a little lesson on here in Utah <laughs> right now. But this is a vision for the future. Yeah. This is a vision for a body politic that is not mired in fear and hatred and divisiveness. And I think that is a really, I'm, I am proud to lean this way. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. so John, I told this to Shereen off air, but Anderson Cooper made this comment that maybe the MAGA movement has met its match in this positivity, this, you know, forward looking, this hopeful message. And it seems to be resonating. Now, I'm curious what you think about it. Cause what, what Cooper said is that, People, you know, kind of did kind of match Donald where he, Donald, I call him, match Trump where he was by being, you know, insulting or name calling or divisive or, you know, whatever his techniques are, lying. Yeah. <laughs> and that maybe the the whole time what you needed to do is be more aspirational and forward looking, like what's happening in the Democratic Party right now. Yeah. And there are strong aspects of the Republican Party that is uh, being driven by fear by change and, and so forth. Um, and, and I've always come from the perspective of how do you, how do you focus on the vision where you're going? Mm -hmm. Now I, I would disagree somewhat. Um, when I listen to the democratic message and I'll pick specifically Bernie Sanders yeah. to, to me, his message does not sound like a vision of hope. Oh. To me, it sounds it, like economic to, disaster to me. Yeah, but to okay, me it, just it also sounds like living without medical debt. It sounds like being able to go to college, to afford a home, to have a job that pays you a decent wage. I'm sorry that sounds like disaster to you. Well, <laughs> I don't want to do all that. I just is, do it differently. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but to me, what it says is, is I don't trust you to basically run your life and we need to take the money from you and we need to do all this stuff. You're not da, da, running da, da, da. your life. Corporations are running our lives here. Well, uh, But I don't hear hope coming from him. Okay. And, and I will grant... I, I did catch uh, part of Barack's speech last night, much more optimistic and, and hopeful. And, and I get that perception and, and why that's coming through. Now, I also would argue that that Kamala has a, a honeymoon period right now. And so so she is kind of, you know, floating on cloud nine, if you will, just barely coming out of the gate. And, and it has, it has oh, it, a lot of that it's positive gotta feel going so on. crazy. They showed a picture last night of her in the plane. Of course, she'd been at a a rally in Milwaukee. Yeah, and they showed her on the plane watching her husband's speech, and they said that they delayed landing for fifteen or twenty minutes so he could finish the speech and she could watch it. So yeah. I guess did circles or something. But imagine what what she's feeling right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. this groundswell. And I gotta say, I'm noticing Tim Wells is really in it too. I don't. There were many shots of him, especially the first night of the convention. We sobbing, right? Mm -hmm. And like not sobbing, weeping, but like definitely crying um, because I do think that like that's an incredible transition. You go from a person who never thought he was going to be the governor of Minnesota to being in this moment, having, you know, this like connection to what I think is a, a an opportunity for an incredible turning point in this country where we leave the toxicity of Trumpism, hopefully, behind and move towards a yeah. more functional well, government. If you go back, I mean, think about Reagan. What was his key thing? Hope and optimism. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at George, morning in America. You look yeah. at George W. Bush. You know, hope and optimism. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, even it wins. even when you look at Bill so, Clinton, it was hope and optimism. It was these messages. Yeah. So I loved um, Barack Obama's line about the the I'm going to call it the chaos, the drama, the lying, the negativity of the Trump years. And he said, you know, there's no going back. And I hear that sequels are always 
Worse. Worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was pretty I, clever. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, I would love to just give a second to shout out to uh, a listener who wrote in and asked us to talk a little bit about Tim Walls. We talked about Let's Tim Walls last last uh, episode as well. But I just want to add that this is a person who I feel like spiritually connected to in the sense that Paul Wellstone is a huge inspiration for me and was also for him. He went through the Wellstone candidate training that I also went through. But when you but hear... Walls, not, a, not the listener, but Walls. Walls, yes. yes. Um, so when you hear these kinds of stories about, you know, I mean, everything from the ways that he's being disparaged to, uh, you know, I think calling into question his service to this country. I find all of that disgusting. But let me just outline for you some of the things that they've been able to do in Minnesota. So they put in the largest increase in education funding in 15 years. I have friends who are teachers in Minnesota. They are happy to be in the classroom there. I have teacher friends who are teachers in Utah who are honestly exhausted going yeah. back to work each year. I mean, it means something to have a governor that's a, a been a teacher. Had been a teacher. Yeah. Uh, bolstered affordable uh, child care in the state, expanded access to pre-K. Those are also things that we are working on in this state. So don't come at me and tell me that's some progressive agenda. That's we're doing a progressive it, agenda. We're doing it here too. Um, increased transparency. So you're saying we're becoming like California. I'm saying increasing transparency for a prescription drug companies so that the cost of those drugs is um, more available to the public to understand that. Protected access to abortion, which I think is critically important unless we want to become Idaho or Texas where people are regularly dying for, from things they do not have to die from. And insulin affordability, small list here. But when you, th- and, and honestly, insulin affordability, we've also done here. Uh, when you think about the uh, right to for fel- for people who have had a felony to be able to go on and vote, we've done that here as well. So these are actually just good policies yeah. that many people agree well, and on. And so, Shireen, we also have October 1 put we, on your calendar that, do. that Tim debate. Walls and J.D. Vance will debate. This will be... Is that a for sure? Or yes, a... CBS... No, J.D. Vance has said he's oh, is this... likely. Okay, and CBS is the host. Not, but, yeah. <laughs> oh, how does he not do it? But uh, we have something to listen for. We have something to listen. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. There's no debate coming to Utah. No No debate here. No. Hey, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Uh, Shereen Gorbani, John Dougal, Natalie Gochner. Stay tuned. You're listening to Both Sides of the Aisle on Utah Public Radio. We love to hear from listeners like you. If you would like to send us a comment, email bsotapodcast at gmail.com. That's b. S-O-T-A podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Shireen Gorbani on the left. John Dougal on the right. Natalie Gochner in the political center. This is both sides of the aisle. Uh, Before we finish this sort of federal, you know, look at the campaign and whatnot, um, Robert Kennedy Jr. Oh, yeah. Don't forget. Don't forget. And by the time this airs, we think he will be solidly endorsing Trump and trying to push his uh, support that way. Yeah, well, uh, the story is that he reached to both the Harris and Trump campaign to In say... In what order, Shireen? I don't know. Um, <laughs> do you know? Well, I heard it Harris first. And I, that's, I think that's what I heard, and too. And if but... that's true, it's sort of like, what the heck? It's so... It's just politics for hire. Well, yeah. So this is... <laughs> I mean, I do... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So he has said now... I mean, I think the writing's There's on lot, the wall. lots of candidates that reach out and say, well, you know, yeah. what opportunities are there for me to collaborate? Well, does this mean that Trump said, cool? And what do we think he's in charge of? Yeah. What's, what's he going to be a cabinet member of? Uh, Holy the cow. The FDA? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll you don't, see. You don't think... You don't think FDA? I don't think FDA. I feel like natural resources would be a hilarious one considering his bear behavior. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. So, so we think this, um, I'm going to get a segue to this constitutional amendment special session in our state. Ooh, okay. But uh, apparently they're going to be in Arizona making this announcement, meaning uh, former week. President Trump and, On and Thursday. RFK. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Arizona is a, a state that uh, they're going to have on the ballot. Um, voters be able to decide whether abortion rights should be enshrined in the state's constitution yeah. in November's well, election. Go ahead. I think what's going on partly with RFK is, is with Kamala getting in the race. With Biden, he had mm-hmm. chances and he was up there, what, 14, 15 percent. Now he's, I'm hearing, down to like 8 percent and losing, which means I bet there were a bunch that were backing him instead of Biden. And now that Biden's out, they're excited about Kamala. And so he's losing support. Yeah, he's losing funding. He's not on ballots in states that he needs to be on. This is a disaster. And it was from the beginning, mm-hmm. um, a complete fool's errand. But, you know, fools are going to be fools. Yeah. Well, so I'm making the connection that you have abortion on the ballot in November and this the issue of how do voters and legislators 
exercise their power. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we have, of course, in this... Directly or indirectly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. And we have, of course, in this state, a legislature that got hit with a Supreme Court decision that basically says you can't meddle with initiative petitions. Well, it does say that you are able to make needed changes. Just can't impair. You can't along, impair the yeah, intent. Along the intent. But yeah, yeah, you can't impair the intent. And the legislature sees that as like, whoa, we have all sorts of initiative petitions that pass that need all sorts of adjustments. Which they've been able to do. Well, and they're used to two buckets. There's the Constitution, mm-hmm. which takes a legislature two-thirds vote plus the public to change it. And then their statute, which is just run of the mill and we can change it anytime we want to. That's the world they came from. And all of a sudden this initiative is kind of this super, yeah, you know, elevated statute, which all of a sudden, what does this mean? What it means is that they are losing power. This is a power grab to continue to say that the end all be all of, of lawmaking in our state is in their hands. And Shireen, is it is it a power grab if the public gets to vote? Uh, no, no, but I think moving this as you quick, know what I'm saying. I mean, they're putting something on the ballot, but the, still the public gets to vote. They couldn't have waited until January to put this on. Uh, it's you, you know this the is issue a there. Rushed process. Well, but you know the issue there is that it has to be a general election, and so if they don't get it this November, they have to wait two years, and in that two, two years, years, and ballots get printed in a few weeks. I and in that, that two years, some harm could occur in our state. Sports betting, sure, alcohol. You know, changing Utah values. I mean, this is the point that the legislature's making. The point that they're making, though, to me, I find to be uh, honestly hysterical. The kinds of ballot initiatives that we're talking about, uh, Medicaid expansion so that poor folks could have access and, and working class folks could have access to the health care they needed. Better boundaries, which Utah said we would like to pick our politicians and not have them pick us. The Utah legislature threw that in the trash. Mm-hmm. The changes that they made, honestly, to medical marijuana when that passed have made it, I think, a worse uh, implementation than they had anticipated. But that's on them. They mm-hmm. wanted to change the mm-hmm. rules, so they got to do that. We do not have the problem of California that all of these you know, different initiatives are coming up all the time. They're very unusual in Utah because the legislature has already made them very difficult to pass. I will also say it's a bit and much we should for me. put a little bit of more detail well, on that. Difficult to get on the you ballot. Have, it's, on the ballot. Have, it's easier to pass. It's easy to pass, it's, yeah. You have to get X amount of signatures in X amount of Senate districts, yeah. but the bar is pretty high. And, and they it's, change the forms and the specificity mm-hmm. with which they have to have that information. But I would just also say, I would ask our listeners to ask their legislators if they also, if they're so afraid of outside influences coming in and running ballot initiatives, do they have a similar problem with our legislators regularly taking legislation from organizations like ALEC or straight from different states and running it in our state when no one asked them to? That's how we got the trans bathroom bill and a bunch of other laws that honestly we don't need. We didn't need. So I think they should hold themselves to the same standard. And I also want to know, truly, it's like a bit much for me to listen to this kind of rhetoric when I'm pretty sure this state put over $200,000 into California when they did Prop 8. So this is absolutely a constructed <laughs> okay, John, fake crisis. I've seen Shireen energized, but not like this. Was it only 200000 <laughs> Good question. She's energized on this issue. You've been on Capitol Hill today. It's the day of the special session. Oh, what the say emergency you? special session. Yeah, this yeah, is not what, an emergency. What say you? What say I? Well, well, one, this highlights the issue of an emergency. An emergency is whatever the legislature dictates, which I had concerns way back when they were passing that. Uh, what I thought was a more appropriate bound was to say, if the governor declares an emergency, then the legislature has the authority to call themselves in rather than carte blanche, whatever they want. Um, and so this is just to make sure listeners know, governors call our legislature into special session, but X amount of years ago, I don't remember, three years ago? A few years ago. It was on the ballot, and we changed our constitution that allowed the legislature to call themselves into special session if it was an emergency, which is what they've done here. It came out of COVID. And so in a normal, like, um, balance of power thing, this could only have happened if the governor would have enabled it. But in this case, they got to do it themselves. Yes. And so then... Uh, so I'm not sure this is an emergency. I think this is an important issue. It, what they're facing is clearly a concern of what is the long-term ramifications of this weird world we have with this super statute concept. Um, and some are saying it's broader than it, it, it applies to just pretty much anything in an initiative. Others say it's really just about reforming government and therefore it's much narrower. And where this comes into play is what that means is if it deals with, let's say, recreational marijuana, the legislature could overturn it. It wouldn't matter. Because that's but not it, reforming government. Because that's not reforming government. Yeah. But if it had to do with, let's say, a jungle primary, or, or there is no partisan primary. Or fair then districts. That, or then fair it, districts. Then, then that would be reforming government, and therefore it would have this super sacred 
um, intent yeah. that the legislature has to respect. Um, I think it's easier to message saying this is rushed and it's taking your power away. I think it's going to be much harder for the legislature to message why this is beneficial. And I think it also then, if the public votes against it, the legislature runs the risk of the earmark question on the income tax, whether that also gets voted down because the public just says, well, you're oh, playing I hadn't a game. thought about that. We're, we're going to no shoot, shoot them both down. Yeah. I haven't thought about that. Okay. I am such a centrist, a political moderate. I, Thank I'm goodness o- you're here. Well, but I'm okay with this. Whoa. Uh, but, <laughs> but let me tell you why, Shereen. Okay. I know that they're also passing a companion bill that is triggered by if this passes in November, and the companion bill basically limits the legislature what they can do. And the companion bill essentially says they cannot... Um, they don't use the word intent, but they talk about, you know, the, I'll just use the word intent, you know, that they can't mess with the intent of the legislation. Which is actually already what we have. So, okay. so this is but, but, totally but unnecessary. But that's what I'm saying is the Supreme Court changed things. And what they're doing is put it back to where it's been for 137 well, years. Case, you probably no, ought to then put it in, though. If that's the case, you probably ought to put it in the Constitution I rather pref- than statute. I would that prefer statute would that, but that's not what we're getting but I think it's better to have this statutory protection. And I I'm, I take some comfort in that the public gets to vote. I'm okay. going to take a ton of comfort in that. I, okay, I agree. But I just have to ask, has this reasonably, do you see that there are ways in which this has reasonably caused a crisis? Is this an emergency? Should this be happening over the course of 48 hours? Oh, you know, I would love at least 30 days on this. Right. And I, you know, when they say, oh, we have to print the ballots, I'm like... Okay, come on. Right. Like we can like hire more printers, but there's something about 45 days Motor, bef- yeah, for out of military, military. military voting. Yeah. But so I think you have a couple of weeks, though, still that we could debate this, have a town hall on it. But we're not going to get that. No, we're not going to. We're get not going to get that. And, and, and well, if you look at 45 days, that's literally third week of September. Okay. And that's that's why this will have a really difficult time passing. But. But they're making the argument and the public will have a chance to be educated on the issue. And the more you look at it, the more you'll recognize that this is more complicated than you think. It's easy to say power grab. It's granting them more power. It is. It, yeah. And and we have a check on them. We can vote them out. Well, okay. I, good luck. Tried. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say from their perspective, it's not granting them more power. But I think the argument that, that if I were you would be they are shrinking the power of the public. Yes, they are. And I think we should also ask this question. When this state becomes total Democrat control, do you want this to be the framework? Is this how you want things to come? John, what are you hearing? Well, this is one of those things I I tell folks, do not create the government you want when you're in the majority. That's right. Create the government you can live under when you're in the minority because... Because it can happen. Political wins change. And I get get that we don't quite understand from my side what it means to be in the political minority because we've been the majority for 40, 50 years now. I... Um, But... This is, you know, things can change yeah. and they are my, changing. My in son-in-law, state. who's a hydrologist, he shouldn't be necessarily be teaching me how the Constitution and balance of power work. But he he was telling me I read something that tells you to think of it like this a tri- how the water. Is he said, think of it like a triangle. And right. at one point is the the governor, and another point is the legislature, and another point is the judicial branch. Sure. And he's like, and they're always pulling and tense, you know, and they have to all be present to to find the right balance and checks on power. What are you hearing on Capitol Hill about Governor Cox on this? Where is he on this? I. Other than I saw him put out an email, a campaign-related email about we don't want Utah to turn into California, a, I, I have not, I have not heard anything else. I just think that that's, I mean, I think the business community is weighing in and things are happening, but the governor really needs to help us here. Yeah, clearly the legislature is frustrated with Supreme Court. You've got this one. And now then watch got him the, change that. Then you've got the abortion uh, ruling that they had, and so both of those from a, a Republican majority in the legislature is like, what is going on in the okay, courts? Okay, but those Supreme Court justices were put there by a Republican supermajority. So we got a minute and a half, and I want to do two things. I want to just uh, y- did you see the ad of of um, Phil Lyman and uh, Brian King? Brian King. Quick comments on that. This is the disagree better ad of those two. Didn't love it. I don't know. I mean, really? it, it, yeah. It got some attention for him and, and stuff like that. I don't I know what will how, happen at the end of the day I think, for either. I mean, I think Phil Lyman is overreaching here in a big, big way. I would yeah. not be doing what he's doing. But I I saw when um, the when Brian King did that wink on Disagree Better, I thought that was clever. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, Senator Maine. What okay. a woman. Go I just ahead, have to Shereen. say, Senator Karen Maine was an incredible leader on labor, an absolute fighter and defender of the working class in this state. 
Um, I'm so sad about her passing. And I just know that she gave she her whole family. Um, she and her and her late husband also gave so much to the state. So I served with Eddie Maine. Mm, wow. Her husband. Away, her husband. And then he passed away. And then Karen came in while I was still in the legislature. And so I've known them both. She was, she was a, a passionate, articulate senator. She did not miss a beat mm. coming in, uh, replacing her husband. Um, she was a passionate defender of unions. Um, and while we disagreed on many issues, we, you know, we're good friends and stuff. And so I, I, I feel very sorry for her family as well as her very close friends who are suffering right now. And I would just say that these same comments would be made about her if she were living. That's what's mm -hmm. impressive about her. Okay, great program. Natalie Gochner with Shereen Gorbani, John Dougal. Programs produced by Anthony Skoma. Thanks, everybody, for listening.